scripture lesson for today is from Mark 10. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us on your right and the other on your left, at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are saying, asking the Lord Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Thank you, Deacon. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Must admit, boring sermons can be boring sometimes. You heard me correctly. Sermons can be boring sometimes. <laughs> sometimes they're boring for the content that they contain. Other times they're boring for the delivery, often too long. But for me, sometimes sermons are boring because I know how they're going to end. And that can get boring after a while. You know how every sermon ends. Yet week after week you come back to hear it over and over again. That old gospel story. The greatest story ever told. The story of Jesus. It was like when I was young I used to watch Scooby-Doo every morning. A cartoon. And Scooby-Doo used to frustrate me because it ended the same every time. The Get Along Gang would capture the ghost and unmask the ghost. And there was some old custodian or some other person plotting to take over the town. And the end was always the same. I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you meddling kids. And every morning I tell myself, you know, just once, just once I want the bad guys to get away with it. You know, there's just one time, can you give me a cartoon where they get into a mess and they can't get out of it? That's not really how it goes. I used to like those Choose Your Own Adventure books. These were books that I had when I had a child. You kind of read along and then you get to some conflict. The hero would have to make a decision. You could go through this door or go through that door. And it would say, if you want to go to this door, turn to page such and such. If you want to go through that door, turn to page such and such. I remember I had an Indiana Jones book. And I would go to the back of the book and try to find the ending where Indiana Jones gets run over by the boulder. And then try to make my way to that ending. That was a pretty dark job, if you think about it. <laughs> One time I, uh, uh, related to Choose Your Own Adventure and all that, you know, there, there were those <coughs> times where I did want it to end with some ambiguity, not to be clean and all wrapped up at the end. It just, that's how I thought, in a way. I remember one time I was preaching a sermon on the book of Job, and many of you who have read Job, you know, it's in the Old Testament, Jesus is not in there explicitly, and so we walked through the story of Job, of how Job lost everything, and the grief and the turmoil and the trauma that Job had, and Job, in his courageous faith, turned to God and said, and, and wished for an umpire to come and, and navigate this relationship with God, and spent some 33 chapters going back and forth with his friends, and praying to God until God shows up at the end, and there, although God blesses Job at the end. There really is no clean ending. God confronts Job and says, Who, where, where were you when I created the earth? Where were you when I pulled in the monsters of Leviathan 
Who are you to ask what kind of life you ought to live? And even though Job kind of has an ending where everything is returned to him, you can't help but to think that Job still carries on this grief and this trauma. It's an ambiguous ending. And I think for many reasons, Job is appropriate for us because we too rarely have a happy ending now and then. And there is ambiguity and complexity in life. And I like how Job ends because it acknowledges that our stories don't always end happily ever after. Well, I preached that sermon, and I remember, as soon as I finished the sermon, I was going to pack up some things, and an old Lutheran, retired Lutheran pastor came up to me and said, I'm really angry with you, pastor. And I said, oh, do tell. And the pastor said, you didn't end the sermon right. I didn't end the sermon right. You're going to tell me, you know, how, give me some advice here. How would you recommend? You have to end it with Jesus. And I said, well, you know, in this story, we kind of let off with some grief and some ambiguity and the complexity. He says, no, you always have to end on a good note with Jesus. And I thought, yeah, well, maybe, but I don't want to give people the wrong impression that somehow the story can be wrapped up nice, like a show or like a TV drama where the conflicts come to the end. Sometimes we need to be left knowing that life is complex and that there aren't easy answers at the end of every day. There's an old preaching professor by the name of Eugene Lowry. I read his book this past week. It's a classic book in which he says that sermons need to be episodic, kind of like television shows. And he wrote this almost at the end of the 80s, early 90s, where media was really kind of consuming households. And he said in order to speak to the current day person, you need to have tailor your uh, sermons kind of like a playwright, where you have a beginning, middle, and an end, and there has to be conflict at the beginning kind of wrap it up and bring it up to the end to a story of redemption. He called it episodic preaching, as if we live lives like episodes of television, where things get wrapped up in 30 minutes, where there are happy endings, where we can control the outcomes and not worry because things are going to turn out how we want them to turn out. But life isn't that way. You know as well as I do that when you walk in the midst of hardships in life or the difficulties that you face or the uncertainties in life and you start say, say we're calling that Lord's Prayer and you say in the middle of the prayer, God give us this day our daily bread, that God only provides just enough for today. That Jesus tells us we don't know what's coming tomorrow so we ought to let tomorrow worry about itself. But if you're like me, you want to end the day knowing that you're in good hands, knowing uh, what tomorrow will bring, or at least trying to control what tomorrow ought to bring. And you know as well as I do that sometimes life is not like that. Answers are hard to find. Sometimes we have to learn what the right questions are. <laughs> Difficulties are not resolved and uncertainty lingers. What ought we to do? In our gospel lesson for today, Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem with his disciples, and the disciples think they know how this story is going to end. And Jesus starts to talk about, as they walk to Jerusalem, that this path to Jerusalem will not end how they think it will end. In fact, the scribes and the chief priests will break up the Son of Man and torture him and lead him to his death. And yes, in three days he will rise again. But as soon as Jesus uses that term of Son of Man, a whole mental map starts to form in the life of the disciples as they think that they are on their way to Jerusalem in order to overthrow the Romans. All of the stories that they grew up with in the Old Testament about how the Messiah is going to come in order to overthrow those foreigners, cast out the enemies of people, and reclaim God's throne in Jerusalem came to their mind as Jesus was speaking, and it's almost as if, as they had this mental picture of going to Jerusalem to finally throw, to overthrow those Romans, that they failed to hear what Jesus had to say. They thought they knew how that story was going to end. And Jesus is trying to tell them in plain words, not parables, not an encrypted teaching, as clear as day, that the Son of Man will go in order to be tortured and to die and to rise again. You get the sense that they're hard of hearing, that the disciples are used to living episodic lives in which they think everything is going to turn out well in the end. And here you have James and John coming to the front of the pack and having the courage to say, Jesus, when you come to your glory, let us sit at your left and your right hand. Give us those places of honor. And Jesus said, as simple as that, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink the cup 
that I drink. Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Now we know on this side of the empty tomb that this language is loaded. We know that that cup is not only communal, but that cup points to the sacrifice that Jesus is making in order to give himself, as scripture says, as a ransom for many. In order to take on the sins of the world and the burdens that we no longer need to bear as he carries that to the cross. And you have to remember that it was on the night that he was betrayed that he prayed to God in his own sense of drama, trauma and grief. Lord, please take this cup away, but not my will, but thine be done. Can the disciples drink that kind of cup? Or are they still living the kind of life asking certain things of Jesus in order to try to control their circumstances? In order to try to ensure that by the end of the day all the conflicts will be resolved and all the questions answered? And Jesus says, are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? This idea of being baptized, you have to remember, is a word of immersion. It's a word of being submerged, of giving oneself entirely over to the will of God, to be submerged in the will of God, to be willing to go through whatever God has, and to hand oneself over to the purposes of God. Not to control the situation, but literally to be controlled by God. Jesus tells them as much. Tells them that they can't get their way. And then he goes on in a few more sentences to tell them that in the world and how the world works, leaders lord over others. The tyrants tell people what to do. But if you want to go to glory, if you want to drink this cup, if you want to be baptized with this baptism, then you're going to serve. And you're going to be a slave to all. You're going to give your life as a ransom and follow in my footsteps. For the way to the crown of the kingdom of God is not through glory and military might or scheming. It's through the cross. You're following Jesus by being a disciple to live out of an ethic of submission and of service to one another as we seek to serve him. See, verse 43, he tells them very clearly, while the Gentiles do whatever they want, while they lord over each other trying to get their way, it is not so with you. For the Son of Man did not come to, serve, to be served, but to serve. William Barclay, the great Scottish commentator, on reflecting on these scriptures, tell us that Jesus' whole life was a model for us. His whole life was one long act of submission to God. And we sometimes forget that following in the footsteps of Jesus means drinking that cup of uncertainty or hardship. It means being submerged in a purpose in the purposes of God in which we have to place ourselves aside and be inconvenienced every once in a while, to find hardships and to find difficulties every once in a while, as we find ourselves not only in the midst of our own hardships, but walking with people who need us to be there in the midst of their hardships as well. In order to enter into the brokenness of the world to join Jesus in repairing the world, in bringing healing by serving others, and by having a love in which we abandon all of who we are in order to give ourselves for others. See, this is no clean episode that ends in 30 minutes. This is a choose-your-own-adventure story in which every day you have to choose to either walk the wide path that leads to destruction, the wide and easy path, or the narrow door that leads to eternal life. That is difficult. That demands our whole attention and all of who we are. I guess really the question that we need to ask is, where does your story end? Or where does this story end for you? For some people, their story ends at the cross. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for many. Jesus gave himself on that cross in order to die for our sins and we gain eternal life. And that's where the story ends. We have our eternal life, we have our fire insurance ticket, and we're good to go. And that's where the story ends. <coughs> For some of us, the story ends at the empty tomb. Jesus rose from the grave. We celebrate on Easter. In fact, some of us only show up at Easter to celebrate that because that's where the story ends. Jesus rose from the grave. Again, we have resurrection and new life. Hooray. We go about our business. That's where the story ends. But what Jesus is telling his disciples here as he, as he points out the cup more so than rising on the third day is that the story for us does not end 
Neither at the cross nor at the empty tomb. But in the ongoing, unfolding mission that God has for us as we seek to follow the risen Christ into each and every day. As God's story of redemption unfolds in our midst, our story doesn't end. We don't conclude, we don't have an end to the story, but we continue to live out the calling to which God has called us in order to walk among people who need hope and need healing in the uncertainties and the difficulties that they face too. You see, it's hard to realize that when we don't get answers and our conflicts don't automatically get resolved in one day. It's easier to understand that when you're walking with someone who has difficulties that you just can't give them easy answers and cheap cliches. You can't smooth things over and say, it'll be all right, honey. You can't give those cheap cliches by saying, don't worry. You don't have to worry about a thing. Things will be all right. No, things won't be all right sometimes. The grief that sometimes overwhelms us will continue to come. And the hardships that we face as individuals will continue to unfold in our life. But there's one thing I can tell you, church, that as you, you move through this story of Mark and you continue in that mission of Christ, if you go back to, say, John 14, where Jesus says this very thing, that Jesus also says that no matter where you find yourself, I will be with you always, unto the end of the age. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, no matter where you are in life, God will meet you there, whether it's the darkest valley of the shadow of death or the mountaintop experience in which all is going well. Come what may, Jesus will be with you. Jesus never ever told us that our life will be easy once we have a relationship with him, but Jesus does promise that he'll never let us go. No matter where we find ourselves, we need to hold on tight and hold on to Jesus. <laughs> For his baptism is our baptism, and his cup is our cup, but so is resurrection, and so is glory, and so is hope, and healing, and reconciliation, and forgiveness, and all of these little points of life that continue to break into our darkness every day. Even though our night may be enshrouded in darkness, and sorrow may last for a night, we know that as those points of light break in, joy comes in the morning. There's a story by another preaching professor, Tom Long, who had a chance to interview a South Korean pastor who years ago was arrested for preaching his faith in Asia. The South Korean pastor went to jail and they tortured him day after day, week after week. Every once in a while, they bring him out before the tribunal, and the judge would say, Recant your faith, turn away from this Jesus that you proclaim, and we'll let you go free. We'll let you go back to your children and your family. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't give up. He stood fast. He proclaimed his faith. He would not let go of Jesus. And so they'd send him back into the stockade, torture him again, continue to torture him for months and months and months. This happened over and over again. They bring him out, ask, asked him and challenged him to recant, to turn away. He wouldn't do it until finally his patience wore thin. He became vulnerable and exhausted. He had given all that he had to his faith, and he made the decision one day that the next time he went before the judge, he was gonna just throw in the towel. He couldn't stand it anymore. His body was broken and he couldn't do it, and he was going to just turn away, say that he recanted, and just be done with this whole debacle, this whole torturous event. And finally, the prisoners came for him one day, and he made that decision, and they led him into the courthouse. But something was different on that day. He looked over to his side, and there were his family and his friends. And his wife was able to lean in as he walked by, and, he whisked, and she whispered to him very clearly and very audibly, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And at that moment, he went before the judge, and the judge said, if you recant your faith, you can rejoin your wife and your children. They're right there. He says, I won't do it. I will not turn away from my faith, because Jesus is alive. And if you're looking for happy ending, that's where the sermon 